ahead and get started. I'm there might be some more people dropping in, and that's fine. Um, my name is Joanne Gro, and I am co-presenting with Tadeo and Nadia Minerva today. Um, so a little bit about me. My um, current position is Director of Professional Learning at City Center for Collaborative Learning. That's a nonprofit located in Tucson, Arizona that um, oversees three very small and innovative charter schools and does professional learning for um, people throughout Southern Arizona. Good morning, buenos dias everybody. My name is Tadeo Feaster. I teach sixth and seventh grade here at the Palafrey Freedom School University campus. And I run our expedition and leadership program, which is pretty exciting where we get kids out, out of this, these walls into the global classroom. Uh, each week, a whole group gets to go on a, on a field trip. And I'm super excited also to have two of our science seventh graders with me right here. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Hello, I'm Minerva. And hi, I'm Nadia. OK, terrific. Um, let me get this PowerPoint going. OK, just a little bit about us. I mean, we kind of said what we are, but um, I'm on the right. Those are my, that's my family, my partner, Santo, my grown, fully launched children, Brianna and Jacob. I do work in addition um, to working, um, doing professional learning I, at here at City Center. I do work with PBL Works on PBL, and I work with Knowledge Works on PCBL. So um, that's this workshop, which is kind of the marriage of two of my passions. Today, you want to explain that picture? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, yeah, so my background is in marine sciences, and I spent a lot of time. Uh, I was the station manager for Prescott College's uh, Center for Cultural uh, and Ecology down in Bahia de Quino, Sonora, Mexico. Uh, for 17 years, I was the station manager, taught classes for Prescott College, led the out, uh, out, outdoor action and adventure programs. Uh, was a boat captain and things like that. So I bring a lot of field biology knowledge to the classroom and love getting students outdoors as much as possible. And as we go forward, I just want to say, feel free to drop questions in the chat and um, today and I will be monitoring them and answering them you know, as we go. So this is our agenda for today. Um, I'm going to give a kind of quick overview on PBL and competency-based learning. And then I'm turning it over to our practitioners who will be talking about a weather and climate resiliency project. Um, and then we'll be ending with kind of suggestions. This is a workshop for um, what are steps that you might take to um, enter into this work. Um, and I have three different levels and different ways and pathways um, to, that you might wanna choose to enter this work. So we're gonna start with a poll. So we're coming from Tucson, Arizona. So um, we have four different animals that are indigenous to where we live. So if you are newish to PCBL and PBL, you are gonna choose number one, the Gila monster. Um, if you are expert at PCBL, but kind of newish to PBL, you're gonna choose the Roadrunner number two. If you are um, newish to PCBL, but expert at PBL, go ahead and pick three, our lovely smelling javelina. And if you are expert at both PCBL and PBL, but want to see how they fit and work together, you get our lovely tarantula wasp who will sting but, and paralyze a tarantula, lay its eggs in the tarantula, and the eggs will hatch and then eat off the tarantula. So, um, and all four of these are native and we see these out and about. So go ahead and vote. You guys are at least javelinas for sure. Maybe even a tarantula. <laughs> okay, and then we can go ahead and publish the poll. So we have people who are newish to both, some who are um, newish to PCBL, but expert at PBL. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you for participating. Okay, so to give a little context, um, and I have to tell the story of 
Um, if we kind of go back in time to 2016, I was at a conference, it was in person, it was the final fall forum for the Coalition of Essential Schools, if you know that organization that was in Maine. And I went to a PowerPoint that was done by a school that, um, similar to this, I was talking about their journey for um, personalized competency-based learning, and I was blown away. And um, so they shared their kind of like the the PowerPoint was the, the workshop was about like the pitfalls and promises. Um, but I came back thinking like, this is what we do. We have a commitment towards equity. We have a commitment towards excellence. And um, this has to be our next step. So I came back, I shared that PowerPoint with the leadership team. Um, they were interested, but I don't think I quite conveyed the power that the people had who had lived through it. So um, there was the next year we, um, we formed a team that was made of leadership and teachers to look into the why. And they spent a year thinking about why should we do this? Um, a lot of the work at that time as a lot of people enter into this work was around equitable grading practices. Um, and so we built that kind of collective knowledge that first year. And then the next year we did some professional learning. So we worked with a great main partnership um, to start identifying our um, anchor competencies. We worked with Solution Tree, um, talking about equitable grading practices. And then the next year, we were able to have a teacher team that actually wrote our competencies. And, um, and, I, and we had a Columbus site visit. And I put that in quotations because we had a team of teachers all ready to go. We were at the airport. We were so excited to see Marysville School um, in Columbus, Ohio, and then um, life happened, and the the plane, you know, I don't know what had mechanical issues, and we could not find another flight. It was going to be a quick trip, and what um, the team did, which I was so proud of, was like we have subs, we have this time devoted. Let's just do a retreat here in Tucson and just do the work and the planning ourselves. And so that's what happened, and that kind of guided us for the next few years. The following year, we were actually doing some implementation using on the competencies that we'd written. We talked a lot about how do we support our students inside and we talked about classroom um, practices that were happening in the classrooms. And then we had a, a LMS team who looked at all different software um, to try to determine which software would do what we wanted to do. And eventually we um, chose Empower and today I will show, talk about Empower some and how it, that is being used. Um, in the middle of there was the pandemic, um, which was really challenging for us as it was for everyone. We continue to do, I should say that we were schools that were founded on project-based learning. So that has been a kind of a through line throughout. Um, we continued to do project-based learning virtually, um, which was interesting and a challenge. And we also had some major leadership turnover um, during those years. So I would say that in those um, pandemic years, we, we were kept static. So, and now that we're back, um, we are kind of jumping back in this summer. We are revising our competencies. We've adopted a new academic framework um, and we had our leadership team go visit a school in Kettle Moraine successfully this time to see some of this work in practice. So that gives a little context. I would say if I, this is not what our workshop's on, but if, if I had any advice to give, I would say that, that the, the communication of the why is something that never ends. So there's always gonna be new students, new teachers with turnaround, there's gonna be new families and that that messaging of why are we doing, why are we doing something that's different? Why is this disruption happening? You just have to be prepared to be saying that over and over again in all sorts of different modalities. So this is this year and this is where we are. We're the summer we revised our competencies or standards. Um, we are in the first year of implementation of a new strategic plan. One of those goals is to design multiple pathways for academic achievement that honors individual learning profiles and diverse lived experiences. Um, so um, we're working on that. We are adopting a new portrait of a graduate as a coalition of essential schools. We had 
from the beginning our um, habits of heart and mind that um, that served us well for almost 20 years as we've been in schools but um, but they were tended to be more academic um, and focused so things like using evidence to support your claims and um, so we're now in a you know a lot has happened in those 20 years uh, and we're in the process of adopting new ones that incorporate more kind of lifelong kind of ways of being dispositions. So we're in the process of that and we're going to continue to um, pro um, do professional development, particularly with a school that is our downtown school that is um, using a, a team teaching model that has incorporates um, all of our teachers at our school and all of our students at school too, and then they're working in on their individual pathways. So that's a little bit of context. So for those of you who are newish to project-based learning, and I, you know, I can't kind of go over all of it, I would highly recommend if you have not yet been to the PBL Works website, pblworks.org is um, an organization I work with and um, has a, amazing resources online. This is a framework that was put together by multiple organizations doing work in project-based learning, talking about what does it mean to be high quality? You probably know that PBL is used um, ubiquitously, a lot like PLCs, so that almost anytime something is hands-on or kind of has some real life application, people often will talk about project-based learning. But what we're talking about has these six criteria that the project is um, connects to an intellectual challenge and requires intellectual accomplishment from the student, that it's authentic to the students um, and, um, and relevant to them in their lives, that there's some sort of public product that often happens at the end. We have exhibitions of learning and a Pennington Street showcase where students share their work, but also can be um, public in terms of bringing people into the class to help them give feedback or to help them um, revise their products, um, that they is that there is a sense of collaboration. It doesn't mean that all projects have to be group work, but in all projects, um, students should be working with each other, giving feedback and learning from each other, seeing each other as funds of knowledge resources, that there's project management happening where there's a time where the students are um, going back and forth between um, inquiry and product creation and that they're managing um, that time um, and that there throughout is reflection where they're reflecting on what they're doing and what they're learning and how they're doing and how it might um, transfer to other places and how does it connect. So that's my very quick overview of PBL. And then um, you know, you are here at the Aurora Institute, so you've probably seen this before. Um, this is Aurora Institute's um, criteria for um, PCBL or definition of PCBL, and we're going to use these. I'm not going to go over these, um, but today, when he talks about his project, is going to incorporate where these different things are can be found in his project. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Joanne. So what better way to kick off this PBL stuff than to just jump right in and do a little PBL together? So we, we do a little pre-assessment, but let me give you a sense of my classroom first. So um, I teach, I have an individual teacher. I don't have any teaching assistants or anything. I have a classroom that's about 23 to 27 students and also have a pretty high percentage of IEPs and 504s. So that just kind of gives you the layout of the classroom. So the unit, I'm gonna do, do talk a little bit about our first unit this, this, this year, which is unit one, weather and climate and weather and climate resiliency. And that word resiliency comes up a lot throughout the entire year and we keep making connections to resiliency and in this case, climate resiliency. So we throw out there the hook, right? The problem statement. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Now, just real quick, um, there's a pre-assessment that happens before this just about standards that relate to weather. 
just to get a sense of where the students are at, what holes we have, what kind of funds of knowledge we have going on, and then we jump right into this hook. So let's do it. The hook. Strong winds, deadly storm surges, and a trail of destruction. Recent hurricanes have wreaked havoc in the United States. And you might be wondering, how does a hurricane work? So the important thing to understand about hurricanes is that they only form over warm water. Think of warm water as the fuel to the engine that is a hurricane. A hurricane forms when warm air over the ocean rises. As that warm air rises, cool air sort of fills in below it, kind of creating that cyclonic action. At the top, it forms clouds, and those clouds create the rain system that we associate with hurricanes. So many people are wondering, is climate change making hurricanes worse? Yes. Um, remember we talked about how warm water is the fuel for a hurricane? Because of climate change, the oceans are much warmer than they used to be. In recent years, we've seen very powerful hurricanes like Harvey and Florence. And the obvious question is, what do they have in common? Both of these hurricanes formed in unusually warm waters. Hurricane Harvey formed in waters around the Gulf of Mexico that were on average about one degree Celsius warmer than average. Florence is being powered by waters that are two degrees Celsius warmer than average. So that's a lot more energy going into the storm. The worry with Florence is not just when it hits land, but how long it will stick around and how far inland that will go. So does this mean we're going to have more storms like this? The short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is storms like this are even worse. Um, there's some talk about potentially raising the hurricane category scale to include a six so for stronger winds than we currently have. Um, there is some concern or some evidence suggesting that hurricanes are moving further north. So that means they're going to show up in places that they haven't traditionally existed, and potentially even in places like Europe. When there's a hurricane, when there's a wildfire, climate change often comes up. But climate change is our new reality. And if we don't take steps to mitigate it, we will continue to see powerful, severe hurricanes. Um, and more and more people are going to be put in harm's way. So this unit is taught during hurricanes. Deadly storm surge. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, this this her, this unit is taught during hurricane season to really track hurricanes as they're happening, to make that relatability with students. And I tell you what, you survey the students, and somebody in the room is going to be directly affected by these. Maybe family members. For example, this year, uh, Puerto Peñasco or Rocky Point is a common tourist destination for people in Tucson and Phoenix. And Hurricane K that came through did a lot of damage. And we had students who literally had stayed in the homes where homes next door were crumbling into the ocean during the storm. And we were tracking that live. Um, this next video is Fort Myers. This is Hurricane Ian that just did that example of that rapid intensification. But we had all kinds of other things happening. The video, oh, here we go, perfect. So there's no audio to this, but think about what we just experienced this hurricane season. We had hurricanes like Typhoon Murdoch that made its way all the way from the Pacific, from the Western Pacific up to the Aleutian Islands, then going all the way into Alaska as a, you know, downgraded from a typhoon. If we go to the other coast in the Atlantic, we had Hurricane Fiona, which made its way from the Caribbean, Florida, and then back out to sea, did more rapid intensification and made landfall in Newfoundland. So these are these uh, things that we're seeing with rapid intensification and hurricanes. And it really brings up this huge central question. How do we create resilient coastal communities in the age of global warming? And so in this project-based learning work, in this unit, we have our driving question. Uh, it says essential question, but same, same, same concept with the driving question. And these are guiding students through the project work, through the activities. And this example is how can we build more resilient communities that weather the impacts of our rapidly changing climate? And this is a real anchor. So we're using hurricanes to anchor the unit. And we're using this driving question to drive a lot of the research, a lot of the thinking behind it, which then plays out in the project work. Uh, take a step back. So we have our learning targets or standards. 
So the unit is built around its standards base. And we're using the Arizona State Science Standards that were revised some years ago, not too long ago. And we find they're really, they're, they're, they're good, they cover it, but we also add some of our district standards, like the habits of hearts and minds. For example, expression and care and inquiry and action. So all these also play a role. Uh, you see here, we have some geography, we have earth heating, and we have modeling. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we illustrate modeling. So let's go to the playlist now. So Empower Learning, as Joanne described, is our learning management system. We were really fortunate to have, we they weren't predicting the, uh, the COVID pandemic, but we had this in place during our remote learning. And that was a game changer. So you're looking right now at one of my playlists and um, playlists are just as they say a playlist. I like to organize them by unit. So this is unit one, weather and climate resiliency playlist. And you'll see I tag some of these things that are really important that we see in the playlist. So pathways and pacing, for example. So what you're looking at is a matrices of different activities. There can be more traditional science readings. You see that with the earth, you know, that looks like the cover of the book. I use other platforms that work together like Nearpod, which is an important, you know, way that I deliver interactive activities to the students. This was all an extension of remote learning too that I did. So all of what you're seeing also occurred during remote learning. Uh, then in here is project work, special videos, special content, and then you'll see, uh, it's hard to see, but there's an activity in here called Next Level. And um, our seventh grade team here is gonna talk about Next Level in a little bit. Let me just continue with the playlist uh, because I wanna get to some of these other uh, tags here. So learner agency. So students are not working on this in a linear like way. Like, Few students actually complete all this work. What they're doing is they're sewing together. Uh, they're sewing together the activities in a way that they can demonstrate mastery in the standards that we're covering. And depending on the different learning styles of the students, it really will depend on how that matrices of putting these activities together works. Some students really gravitate towards the near pods that are interactive and fun and they have gaming elements and videos. Some students like the more traditional readings, read the chapter, do the section review questions. That seems to really call out to certain students. The project work, all students are involved in the project work, but the supporting activities that gathers that evidence that we need to look for mastery in the standards, it really can be pieced together through different activities that really seem to work for students. So they have that learner agency into choosing these different things. Each one of these activities, which is the each icon up there, it is connected to our learning targets or standards based, but it offers a menu of activities. Now, um, so we looked at pathways and pacing, but I wanna talk about how we modify and accommodate for students with IEPs and 504s. Any one of these activities. Now the Nearpods are constructed in a way where that accommodations are built in. So they seem to work really good for kids of all different learning styles. But the readings, you might modify how many questions they answer, or which questions they answer, the depth in which they answer it. So we can scaffold up and down all these activities and we're doing that constantly. We're an all-inclusive classroom with universal accommodations. If you have an IEP, yes, we, we follow that, but, but anybody can get can access accommodations to make the learning very equitable. Uh, another important thing about equity, so I'm gonna go there for a second. So that was student supports that I just referenced. So equity, so we still have a lot of rolling absences. Now I'm not sure how you guys are doing out there, but students uh, occasionally are still getting COVID or getting sick or just taking mental health days and these sort of things. My class can be accessed remotely or in person. Now, of course, if you're doing it remotely, there's things you're gonna miss, the collaborative elements and working with the other kiddos, but you can still access the content, you can still follow the class, you can still keep up with the work and you can demonstrate mastery. 
Um, now, with Empower, you're gathering evidence as students are turning these uh, activities in. And we use that evidence to look at, to formally show mastery, right? Be like, oh, you have this evidence. I see the evidence. You're showing mastery. It's looking really good. But we're doing formal and informal assessments all the time. A conversation on the side, me listening to the vocabulary the students are using during modeling. And yeah, a formal quiz here and there. So these formal and informal assessments are happening all the time. So there we kind of connect to assessments. And then in the project work, we can really start to see mastery develop over time. So playlist, uh, the playlist is awesome and empowers working great for us. And we were so fortunate to have these systems in place for the pandemic. So that, that was lucky. We're also a very small school. So we were very fortunate in that regard. So let's go to the next slide. Wait, before we do that, um, oh, yeah, of course. I want you to, um, can you talk about the, um, I'm sorry, what you called it, next level? Oh what yeah, yeah, and we're gonna come back to that too, but let me throw out there the next level. So my classroom, like all your classrooms, have students of all different levels. And some students get done with activities and their project work maybe a little bit before others. And then we challenge them to go deeper, make these connections about building resilient coastal communities and this idea of resiliency. But I also offer up an activity like Next Level that really makes deep connections of environmental sustainability and equity. And this Next Level and also environmental issues like climate change and uh, like I mentioned, environmental sustainability. Inside this next level, I'm not going to open it up, but there are questions that challenge kids to think about, all right, so why is hurricane response look very differently depending on where these hurricanes happen? For example, there's questions about Hurricane Maria that took place in Puerto Rico and the lack of response and what, how that played out on the island. We, let, we have questions that talk about Hurricane Katrina and have students really think about these connections of how did we drop the ball on a hurricane response in Hurricane Katrina? And why do certain communities have different responses than others? These Today, are all these issues of equity. Can I ask the question that I asked Minerva and Nadia when, I, when we were preparing for this about, um, about what they think about those um, next level? Yeah, and let's get the student voices in here because that is so important. So what I, what I wondered, for you all is, or both of you was, did you feel like doing next level work was, were you resentful because you had to do more work or like, like, was it, did you like it? Like, what was your attitude about doing next level work? Well, we had something to do instead of just sitting down. I did next level and it we was pretty much, we're doing t about Hurricane Fiona and Typhoon Murdoch. And Typhoon Murdoch was cool because we also got to draw a map of where it hit in Alaska. And that was really interesting. And I liked that. Yeah, I thought, at least for me, it was fun because sometimes they has like to find some like really quick things for us to do if like we're finished early. So something to do and just to work on. And not everybody has to like finish it if like they learn slower than other people. So it's like, a next level for some people and other people don't have to do it because they're already getting their other stuff done. So I think it was really good and fun. And one of the reasons why we invited Minerva in and Nadia is they're real gold standard um, examples of doing project work. And they're always thinking about these bigger connections, like making these connections to equity, to environmental sustainability. And so when you look at how they interact with the next level assignments, it's really deep when you see their, their, their responses. And this is a little bit different because in next level, it's more, um, it's short answer responses, but then expanded answer responses. So it's a lot of written text and really diving into the issue. And the readings in the next level are pretty high level readings, but I always offer students an assortment of reading levels to accommodate for all the needs. All right, so let's look at the big idea, which kicks off the playlist. That's the very first thing. And in there, you see the standards that are tagged. I don't, uh, we, we don't need to go through all the standards, but you see that there's six standards tagged. Some are Arizona state standards. 
Some are our habits of hearts and mind standards. We have the essential question or driving question that I mentioned. And also, I just want to talk a little bit about this what we learn section. And it ends, and the reason I tagged it with equity is this ends in global equity. Like, you know, we will also explore how coastal communities of color are disproportionately impacted by climate change and hurricanes. So of course we have equity within our classroom, accessing the content, the content being available to students in regards to the level and the differentiation that's going on. Universal design for learning is used to plan this whole unit out. But then we have these issues of equity at the more global scale of both environment and society. And then the end is the culminating application. And in this case, all the students produce an ArcGIS Esri story map. So in our bank of project PVL outputs, product outcomes, we've got a lot of different things. I'll just mention a couple. So I use ArcGIS Esri story maps, which are a really cool way to show information visually and spatially. We use like uh, infographics, like pick the charts. We do theater. We do, we do so many different things. Uh, so we have this you know, we can draw off a rich list of project activities. At the same time, we have other activities going on that are more like scientific illustration and modeling. And these also show mastery. And these are great ways to do assessments because assessments are happening all the time in this classroom environment. So now I wanted to turn it over to Minerva because here's an example, we don't have time to go through the whole story map, but here's an example of an ArcGIS story map. So Minerva, take it over. This was my story map about Cyclone Paradip that hit Odisha in 1999. Um, this Cyclone Odisha's shores, map, um, it came from Indonesia and hit Odisha. You can see on the map, the big red blob, and it came back down and hit other coastal communities and over 10,000 got killed it was so much that people had to bulldoze the dead into vast faceless graves it was very i i didn't like the the death part about this but i liked using the arcgis story map and i got to research a lot of my, my cyclone i got to personally choose my cyclone um hurricane or typhoon whatever you want to call it and i really like this one because it it's really interesting about what happened in this community Thank you, Minerva. So there's a lot of elements to the story map. This is just a snapshot of some of the pages within the story map. And I really, I really think that ArcGIS story maps are a great, uh, a great project outcome. Um, these will be presented at an exhibition of learning where students do expression in what they learn. Parents will get to see these and they're pretty exciting. Now I want to turn it over to Nadia to talk a little bit about learner agency, some of the modeling we did and scientific illustrations. And we actually have the physical model here that Nadia can show you. So Nadia, take it over. Ah, okay, so as Min is holding up, you can see. So we made this model of the hurricane, okay, hurricane Paradip, and it has on the outside, it has some of Min's slideshows. Um, of the story map on the outside. So um, you know more about it if you haven't read the story map. So in the pictures here, there is, um, there are, so there's pictures of me and me and men of two other, and two other people who worked on a coinciding poster for the hurricane. And there's also, also other posters about other hurricanes. And so all of us got to choose our own hurricanes. And like today it was like, here, here are some basics. You need to have this information, but then we got to choose a hurricane, choose how to do the poster. And it was really interesting. And I love how we have a lot of choice in what we do and how we do it. So everybody had to make a story map, but then people could choose between like a online, poster or like a physical poster or even a physical model like us and it was really interesting because like today let us choose so many different things so many different options not just like you have to do this 
It was really fun and I liked it. And you guys did an incredible job with it. So um, let me talk a little bit about our scientific illustration. So I have a couple of students right now who really find uh, learning, who have a lot of learning challenges in the classroom, but they're also really good artists. So when you present these multi-format ways of students to engage in the learning, demonstrate understanding, it, it's a game changer for some of these kids. So I have some students doing scientific illustrations throughout the year. And it's kind of fun because these things immediately go up in the classroom and they begin to be used as reference materials for the other students. And then the way it works is um, at the end of the year, we keep up some of the best pieces, but I don't mean like best pieces, like any student can have a best piece, pieces that show that students worked hard. They did their best. They put a lot into it. So the next year's kiddos come into a classroom full of art, full of science illustration. And it's really like a living textbook in your classroom up on the walls. So scientific illustration and modeling are, are great activities to support the project work. And in this case, the ArcGIS story map. So that's a little bit about how our classroom works, the way we do project-based learning here at Palo Fre uh, Freedom School University. And um, I really appreciate everybody's time. I'm gonna turn it back over to Joanne now. Thank you so much, Minerva and Nadia for joining us. You guys are incredible. And uh, yeah. I hope have to you say one thing to brag on Minerva and, um, and Nadia, who are not my students. I just met them for the first time yes, uh, Monday when we were practicing. Um, we were talking about the time frame for this, um, and they were kind of, you know, talking about who's going to share what. And then, but when we were talking about the time frame that at Polifer University, this their school, they're also doing a training on. I think the school as a whole is looking at the houseless um, community um, that is, shares kind of our neighborhood with the school, and so there were people coming in to work with the school about that and um and both of them were like well, we can come but we don't we'll miss lunch but we don't want to miss the that training and um and it was just like it was just a natural thing like they didn't even it didn't blink and i was super proud of them for that as well so you all sure. are welcome to stay but you're also welcome to go to that training if you need to can i take a moment just to talk about next steps in pbl classroom sure yeah so um, we're going to go back to reflecting on that driving question. And one of the things we're going to do towards the end of the semester is students in small groups are going to be challenged to design a coastal community in a way that is resilient in the face of sea level rise and climate change. So they'll be using large format sheets of paper and doing scale drawings of what that community might look like, how we build in resiliency when we're building communities. How do we offer things in communities that deal with issues of houselessness and many of the other social and environmental problems that we have going on. And so that's something that's gonna culminate the entire semester. And it's a lot of work, a lot of engineering practices and skills and a lot of decision-making goes into it. The students will have a lot of autonomy of what their city looks like, but they do really need to strive towards social and environmental justice and resiliency, going back to resiliency. So that's where we're going with this. Uh, and we'll be revisiting that idea of resiliency throughout the entire year. Well, that's great. And I'm excited to see that work at the showcase, y'all. Um, yeah. Okay, so to summarize kind of where we are as an organization in terms of um, putting together our work around PBL and our CBL, um, Right now, we have project-based learning units that we're teaching, and we're working to embed um, personalized competency-based learning within those. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we, that can happen, particularly in that messy middle of a project. Um, we're providing students with lots of choice in all sorts of different ways, choice of topic, choice the ways that they learn, the ways that they show, demonstrate um, evidence. And we're moving from thinking about assessment as um, as a way of bringing, gathering evidence for of proficiencies. 
so um, I see a question. So why do you feel it's important to move to more learner agency over progress on competency? I'm interested in our own school is implementing. What have you found? So yeah, so that is, if you're looking at what's still work in progress that shift to more learner agency. So um, ideally in my perspective is, um, you know, that we're Paula Ferry Freedom School. So Paula Ferry would talk about the, you know, against the banking where you have a, a teacher who is just um, opening up the heads of students and dropping information. And it's really about the learner um, co-constructing with the teacher um, what they want to learn, how they want to learn, and why they want to learn. And so we have always, from the start of our school, been about trying to um, get away from the playing school where kids are just doing what they, you know, that strategic or ritual compliance and getting to true engagement. Um, partly because I think the deeper is learning, but but I think most because those habits um, that they are gaining in taking agency will serve them well in their life as they move um, past school to be, you know, everyone talks about lifelong learner, but what does that mean? For me, what that means is that you are thinking about the why of what you want to learn and the how of what you learn, and you feel empowered to, to achieve those goals, and you've had practice and coaching um, in a place that is safe and caring and loving, um, like our middle schools and our high school is. So um, I guess that's what I would say today. What's, what's your thoughts? Why is it important to have it, um, the, the shift to learner agency about their learner? learning. Yeah, and I, I don't feel like these are mutually exclusive in how they're operating in the classroom too. The better I am at creating the PBL units and building in that learner agency, I'm starting to see the better it sticks and the and the, and the better we students are showing mastery in those competencies. I think it's all in the setup, right? A lot of it is in the setup and the design of the PBL units. There is a lot of setup and thought going into these designs and work. But I feel like once you have the template up and going and running, you can really, really, really um, get going with it. So let me see if I understand the question right. I am seeing, this is what I'm seeing. On your slide, that's the reason why I'm asking it. It seems like it was that you were saying that, not that they're mutually exclusive, but maybe learner agency is more than the competencies. I'm not oh. questioning it. I'm trying to learn yeah. from you because we're in the process of going and maybe you had some insights that, that could help us is what I'm trying to say. Right. Oh, it's yeah. not, it, right. So I'm so the way that it's worded, I can see how you think that it's not like this versus this is we want rather than the teachers being the one who is monitoring and pushing and making sure that the students are I mean, there there's a role in there. But um, you'll hear when we talk about at the end when I talk about um, student voice and what we saw, for example, at Kettle Moraine School when we went to the site visit of how students were so much owning you know their progress and it was it was them who were advocating for what they needed rather than a teacher kind of calling them up and saying this is what I see you need to do yeah sorry I misunderstood that a little bit um yeah like um exactly. one of our the director of our overall organization when I, one of my first years he had he said to me like this is you know I see you developing into a great PBL teacher just talk less talk less. <laughs> and I've been on that path for like six years now. And I feel like before I was in the way a lot, I was in the way of learning or trying to script the learning. And the more I'm backing off and the better I'm getting at talking less, better setups and turning it over to the kids, the better outcomes I'm having. So I'm still on that path, but I got a long ways to go. But that was some golden advice way back I mean, not that way back, right? So, but six years ago, that was some excellent advice and I'm still trying to fine tune that. Get out of the way. Yeah, so the two other things that were in addition, so thank you for highlighting that, Avery, that um, and asking that question. Um, so we are working on that portrait of a graduate and building a competencies for those that will be happening this year and next. And then we just joined the Mastery Transcript Consortium. Um, we have been, we do student-led conferences and we do, portfolios at the end of eighth grade. And then at high school, they do gateways at the end of each year where they're looking at and defending their work. Um, so I think that'll make a 
fairly seamless um, shift over towards a mastery transcript consortium, but um, particularly for the high school, we want to kind of figure out how to make sure that we talk nice with secondary ed. So that's where we're at right now. Okay, so we, so speaking of talk less, um, we have been um, talking for a while and, um, and I think what I'd like to do is to give you about 10 minutes to talk, to put you in random breakout rooms and to let you all um, process with each other kind of what you heard or ask questions. Today, and I can pop in, but feel free also to call us into your um, room if you want to ask us a specific question um, or pop back into um, the main room and um, ask us that way. So we're gonna give, it's a 11.47, so I'll, we'll do about 10 minutes. And I'll go ahead and open those breakout rooms. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you had some great conversations. Um, I just want to give people the opportunity before I move on to the next phase of the workshop to either um, come off mute and share something that someone said that you want to raise up for the group, or you can ask a question either verbally or in the chat. I would love to just highlight Krista and um, her reflection. Um, I am currently not having any children of my own, but like Krista highlighted as a parent and as a educator in the space, her having to catch herself um, when she's also thinking about her son's education um, and saying like, of course, I don't want him to have a rope, you know, just learn by rope memory and recall um, and but how important the why is um, not only for his the students that she's actually working with but also her son um, and so I think uh, what I just connected that to is when we talk about certain comments like learning loss of how it's not just the English teacher that is then taking the charge to build up those skills but it does actually rely on literacy being taught in all subjects. Um, so that is my takeaway. So thank you, Krista. And thank you, Joanne, for your, your push to always go for the why. Thank you for sharing. It's great. I love when groups are sharing resources we're all trying to figure this out. Um, so that's what I've learned is that no one has like it all. There's no smooth road to this work. And it's great that when we can be each other's support network. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and feel free to continue to um, ask questions and share. I'm gonna go on to our next phase of the workshop, which is just um, how to get started. So, um, just like any sort of kind of good CBL, um, competency-based CBE um, uh, educator, I've got three different pathways for entering this work. Bye, Nadia and Manura. <laughs> Tell them thanks. Um, so I've got like a level one if you're just starting and level two um, if you're kind of in it and you kind of want a secondary kind of level. And then three is kind of if you're like in it and you're ready to take on kind of big a big um, challenge and what's great about these three different ways is that this works for project-based learning but also if you're in a more traditional classroom you can be thinking about these um, different kind of entry points as well so um, just an easy kind of first step and first success is to think about student choice and universal design they're two separate ways I think that I want to talk about. So, um, so, and I want to distinguish in, in our PBL where we always, and you hear often like voice and choice put together. And I want to distinguish the two from my thinking about choices where students are encouraged to choose from a set of options provided for them, the path of process that works best for them, as opposed to voice, which we're going to talk about later in that third step, which is really students are responsible for or included in, so that's co-designing of their learning options. Um, and there, that is a picture for anyone who's interested. We had a, a genius hour or learning lab um, and that student was learning how to do Halloween makeup. So um, she's actually very beautiful, 
normally without her makeup. So um, I think that voice is, uh, I mean, student choice is a way to, um, an easy step into this and to just thinking about what are you doing and how can you incorporate, be it like a choice board, um, you know, you can think about choice in terms of like what they study. So if you're studying like what Tadeo shared, you're studying hurricanes, but they get to choose where that's happening, the methodology that they're doing, are they reading, are they watching videos, is it a combination, Is um, and then also like how they are sharing their um, their proficiency, like that they know what they know. Is it having a conversation? Is it a traditional quiz? Is there some other way that they're showing? And they get, are making the choices about that. And I think the thing that, I think the kind of secret sauce of choice, in addition to it being um, a, a way to build um, true engagement is to have the reflection piece with it. So when students are choosing and making choices, having them reflect on, why they're making the choices and how did it go? So was working with that per person that your best friend, was that, did that work for you or did that not work for you? And if it didn't work for you, what might you do next time that would make that work for you? Maybe a different choice or maybe that you need to put some structures in when you're working with your best friend. So it's that reflection piece that will help them to uh, make informed and good choices, which often, you know, Middle school kids often don't do that, but that's okay because it's all a learning opportunity. Um, universal design learning. Um, so today I mentioned it when he shared it, and this is a you know a big topic in itself, and I'm not going to go in depth in it. But designing when you were ahead of time, designing for those extreme users in your classrooms that need adaptations, and then thinking about how those adaptations and um, are available for all students to help them be successful. And the um, example that I love to give is that my husband is, um, is aging and he has some challenges with hearing. And so we have um, started putting on the closed caption on our, when we're watching TV and he needs it in order to understand, but, and my hearing is perfect. I just got it tested, but I also appreciate it. It is also helpful for me, especially if we're watching, you know, films with Scottish people or something. So that's an example of an adaptation that he needs to be successful, but it's helpful for me as well. So those are two kind of easy entree points um, that I encourage you to think about and then just make sure that our chat. Today, you're going to be monitoring chat to see if there's any questions or comments. Okay. Um, and we talked about this as well. I just want to um, just re-emphasize that when we're thinking about assessments that, um, you know, in the past, you know, I'm speaking to the choir, like assessments so often was about ranking and sorting and Really, for us, it serves these two purposes. One is data to help teacher plan instruction and support. So it's for the teacher for that purpose. And then it's other is evidence of student mastery. So that thinking about that has been a real shift for our staff to be thinking about if you are with Tadeo at a turtle pond on one of his expeditions, and as you're walking to, I don't know, Jack in the Box for lunch, if you're having a conversation and in that conversation, um, the student shows mastery of a concept that then Tadeo can just, you know, when he gets back, he can open up his Empower and then talk. Can you, Tadeo, just show really quickly how that works in Empower? Yeah, um, I could just describe it really quick too. So you saw the different activities. I have space open for these types of conversations. So there are activities that are built into the playlist that are placeholders for these informal assessments. And so it's not an activity that I'll send a student to do. They're tagged in a way. And if we have that conversation and I get back, I just quickly go on to empower and enter a grade for that experience, right? So I've built in some slots to track these informal types of assessments. And it's funny, it is a shift to think like for, you know, in a traditional school, like the only way that you could have the assessment is if you've taken a test and the test like showed, you know, some sort of like competency. And, you know, I would argue having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with a student or with a small group of students where it's back and forth is actually a much 
more valid um, way of assessing. Yeah, I like the concept of gathering evidence, right? You're just gathering evidence. Um, and then you see how it rolls out in the grade book. And then of course, you have some big decisions to make at the end of the quarter when you're really connecting what you're seeing in the classroom, outside the classroom with the kiddos, what you're seeing on Empower as far as grades, and then going, going from there. And of course, there's formal assessments built in too, as, as sort of more traditional checks. So our level two has to do with what I what happens in that messy middle of a project. So if you think about a project having kind of four components, like there's the launching of the pro of the pro project where you um, introduce a driving question, you do some sort of you know hook activity to get the kids excited. You either share rubrics or you co-construct rubrics. You give a project information sheet, all that kind of front loading that you do in a project. And then there's the end of the project, which is usually culminates in the students presenting in some way and then reflecting and celebrating. So those are kind of fairly kind of static, but the, in the middle, the messy middle is a back and forth of sustained inquiry where students are investigating um, the, the content and the driving question, and then they're constructing whatever product that you're asking them. So in today's case, it was those um, story maps and the models that, that the students were doing. So that's a back and forth process of, of input and building and back and forth, back and forth. And that can look really messy. And um, so, and in fact, this is the things that often happen in that kind of middle of a project. And if you're, you know, in a traditional school where you have, like today I was talking about 27 students, four with IEPs and it's just him, you're gonna have to figure out how do you manage that? And how do you manage that in a way that builds independence for some students and then allows you to do small group instruction with the students that are going to need more support? And so when I was asking on Monday, when I was talking to Tadeo and the students about that, what the students said, I was asking like, um, was that, yes, absolutely that happens um, where Tadeo is working with small groups and they said that a lot of the time the support is coming student to student. Today, did you wanna say anything, add anything to that? Yeah, um, just that we like to identify, you know, and you celebrate the students too, who really are showing proficiency or highly proficient in, in certain areas, whether it's a story map or whether it's with English language arts or whether it's math applications. And, you know, I got kiddos that are better at a lot of things than I am, that's for sure. And they figure out these, these digital content systems. I mean, I'm still pretty old school. They take it to a whole nother level. So I'm learning from them too. And when I'm celebrating that and tapping into that in the classroom in my modeling going on uh, and open to being corrected by students and challenging students to correct me and come up and teach me, it's, it's really, it's, it starts to develop into pretty awesome. So we predetermine certain roles for certain students. So they kind of know they're on call. You're on tech support. You're on Esri story map support. You're, you're supporting this individual. Sometimes we pair. So I'll be like, all right. So Nadia, for example, you know, I've got these two students. They need help developing simple text. So Nadia will go over working with those students, which gives me that freedom to move about the room. Yeah, and what I, you know, I was thinking about this last night today, and I was thinking about in kind of what I often hear when I do trainings around PBL is people talk about like when you're in group work, the challenge of sometimes with heterogeneous groupings that you have one student, I, ex you know, I experience this one student that's doing all the work and the other students and that are kind of like, you know, coasting on that. And I was wondering about was, might some of the students who are being called on to do the support um, feel put upon, but, but, and I don't think that that's the case. I haven't seen that in the case in our schools. And I think one of the reasons why is because if you are thinking about learning, not just as the science standards that are in the, in the, um, the project, but also things like collaboration and leadership and technology and communication and collaboration, all those other soft skills that are super, super important, 
those it's like a natural differentiation. Those students are getting experience and expertise in those areas. Um, and so I think a lot of that is like that culture shift of like what's important and who are we as a group and community. And there are certain students that are proficient or highly proficient that I don't call on to support that way because of social anxieties and things. And they've and the reason I don't call them is we've already determined that ahead of time. I'll come to them and be like, look, you would be great supporting in this role. And they're like, no. And then we explore maybe other ways they could do it, right? Like, for example, share a Google Doc, share a Google Slideshow. You can't share a story map. And they can digitally work with the student where they're not having that individual engagement, but they are supporting that student, peer review and editing, all these kind of things. So I've got that group too that will help, but just they the anxiety okay. makes it hard for them to help one-on-one -on -one in the room at the moment. Um, I skipped over this slide and I just wanted to do all, this is actually from PBL Works and it's a, um, they have a rubric for teacher practices in a highly effective PBL classroom. And one of their seven strategies is managing activities. And I've um, pulled out the top two bullets in that rubric. Um, so the classroom features an appropriate mixture of individual and teamwork with group and small work instruction. And classroom routines and norms are consistently followed during project work time to maximize productivities. I put under there, um, that's my language that I added, the standard operating procedures. And so if you are um, develop with a class with students, what are the standard operation operating procedures when the classroom is in that messy middle and people are doing, you know, all these different things and that there are different pace and different stages and they're choosing different things. If you have these standard operating procedures so that students can work independently. This is something that um, I think a lot of us are a secondary, I'm not going to show this workshop model, but um, a lot of us are secondary, either middle school or high school teachers, but our elementary, I don't know if we have any elementary school teachers here, but um, this is something that they are often really good at, that this idea of the workshop structure or having stations. And so, um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the workshop model, I highly recommend this for um, PBL classrooms. The idea that you start with a mini lesson, which is again, talk less from the teacher, so eight to 12 minutes of instruction, targeted, focused on kind of real need skill that the students will be working. There's work time for the students. Um, in the middle of that day, there's some sort of reconnection where a teacher can kind of make a big kind of announcement to redirect students or maybe correct some mis, um, missteps or mis, con, misconceptions that are happening, more work time. And then at the end, that closing of debriefing how it went, reflecting on how it went so that they can continue to learn and grow. So a lot has been written about workshop um, shop model, but I think we could learn a lot from our sec these secondary teachers from what's going on in elementary. And I just wanna give a quick highlight of thinking about, um, often we are alone in our classrooms, but if you're lucky enough to have an educational assistant or a team teach or, um, I know ASU is working with this idea of, of groups of, of uh, adults that are working together with larger groups of students, just thinking creatively about, um, so not just taking the, in this picture, the whole class where you have two people in front of the whole class, but thinking creatively about how can we make it so that a teacher or multiple adults can work with smaller groups of students because that's where they're gonna be able to target instruction um, at real time based on what students needs. And so you can see that in the breakout group, you have one teacher with a larger group and then it's another teacher with a smaller group, maybe it's a group that they're pulling one group at a time that's working on a group project. You can see stations, <laughs> well, you have like one teacher kind of monitoring all the stations and making kids sure that kids are on task and not killing yourself or destroying anything. And then you have one teacher maybe who is stuck at one station because perhaps that station is a particularly complex idea or concept, or maybe that they're like looking to see kind of which station has students that need extra support. And then the conferencing, um, both for support and also for assessment where you have um, a teacher working one-on-one -on -one or a very small group. You know, sometimes if I give my team a lot of leadway, 
I can recruit somebody to come in, one of the co-principals or education specialist, Sherry, and do a breakout workshop or a conferencing. When we're getting to that, when we're beyond the messy middle part of the project and we're really getting into second and third drafts and final editing and rolling it out, it's great. So I, I do get that support occasionally and capitalize on some of these systems that Joanne is presenting here. And then this is just one other strategy in that messy middle time where students, um, these are called scrum or Kanbans, I think I'm pronouncing that right, where you have um, the things that kids are doing and where they are and they can kind of watch their progress and you can quickly see their progress. Um, and then the third level we have. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about student voice and I wanna share two stories. Um, one, I want to talk about what I saw at my our site visit when we went to Kettle Moraine, and this is in Wisconsin. And if you haven't had a chance to go visit their schools, they have um, public opportunities to come and visit their schools, and they're doing amazing work. And then we'll end with um, today sharing a little bit about what intercession. So when I went to Kettle Moraine, <clears throat> there was a lot that was cool, but one of the cool things that I saw was they do this thing called seminars where they are anywhere between one and three week long and teachers um, do a topic. It's like our intercession where they are excited about a concept. It's, it might be something that they're passionate about or maybe they have some expertise about it and students choose those topics um, and they do that for, you know, for a short period, a short but concentrated amount of time. Well, what um, I was told happens often in those seminars is that they're kind of loosely planned. So maybe you have a seminar let's say on potions and you're talking, it's a, it's a chemistry based um, seminar and kids are like putting together potions and they're like analyzing the chemical kind of reactions. And you have a student, and this is where that voice comes in, who wants to do that, but knows that they need to have, uh, you know, a history competency that they were not successful on that's kind of outstanding and they need to get that um, history comp competency complete, they could go to that um, seminar and say to the teacher, I want to do this, but I, I will also have a thread about how, and I'm just making this up, how women throughout history have, who have been kind of naturalists, have been seen as, as witches or like discriminated against, even though they're just kind of naturalists. And and that is something I would like to do in order to, to um, learn about and then show proficiency in this competency that I need to make up for. So, um, so that was a really awesome way I thought of like students co-constructing learning with their teachers. So um, today, why don't you end and talk about intercession and then we'll show the little video. Intercession is really fun. So it's a lot of work too. Twice a year, we offer a week long series of activities. So each teacher, core teacher, so there's six teachers here, the core teacher, each one of them designs, implements, and carries out a week long special activity. So, for example, um, this, we just finished our fall intercession. There was theater arts, there was a community, community engagement thing. It was really cool. Where, one of our teachers works with a local community engagement center and they were building things for the community and that sort of thing. Um, I typically do intercessions that, that are outdoors, maybe backpacking or overnights, but I was recovering from some surgery. So I made a simple one in design, which is, I called it Lego Mundo, so Lego world. And we took over an entire huge classroom. It's not that huge. But we went wild developing Legos and using engineering techniques and stuff like that. But in the beginning, I opened it up to student voice and learner agency, where I was like, what do you guys want out of this? And two of the students said, well, we do stop motion animation. And I was like, well, that's cool. At the same time, we're going to watch the Lego Batman movie and all these examples of that. So I was like, well, let's do it. Let's do it. But I don't know how to do it. So you guys are running it. So they ran the show. So we produced a series of short videos in Lego Mundo and uh, we're about to see one of them. And it was a huge hit, not only with the students in my intercession, it's about 12 to 14 kids, 
But also once these videos were showed to the rest of the school, and this one in particular went kind of viral on campus. So yeah, intercession's amazing. We do twice a year, a teacher's responsible for an intercession, one in the fall and one in the spring. And they're super diverse in what the kids learn and do and the types of building capacity and, that we do. And today I'm getting that um, the closing is soon. So I'm gonna just show a second of this. There is the survey in the chat. Please take, it's two questions or three questions. Please take time to fill that out and you can continue to please reach out to today and I if you have any questions we'll close on the um on the lego the kids work thank you everybody let's go full screen <laughs> I love the kids in the background. <laughs> okay. So thank you everyone for, for coming to our session. Um, feel free to add anything to the chat today and I'll stay for a couple of minutes, but there is that closing session that Elliot's reminding us that sounds great and um, good luck. Thanks, everybody. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate you guys. Thanks, Joanne.